Welcome everyone to the U.S. Army Human Resources Command live Facebook Town Hall. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be getting underway in just a minute, addressing your questions about the centralized promotion process and board file preparation. But first, a reminder. In addition to the live presentation you are watching here, HRC subject matter experts are already online gathering your questions as they come in to our Facebook feed. As soon as the live portion of today's event is done, they will begin answering your questions directly. So if you have specific questions about centralized promotions and the board process, please add your questions to the queue. HRC experts will respond to every question from the field, striving to get you a response today, and will follow up until every query gets a response. Also, please keep in mind that a video of this event and a transcript of the question and answer exchange will be archived on the HRC website and will be available to all soldiers for future reference. So if you can't join us or if you're catching up with us after the fact, you can still get it right from HRC. And now, to kick off today's town hall, I would like to introduce the host of this event, the Sergeant Major of the Adjutant General Directorate, Sergeant Major Ray Rodriguez. Sergeant Major, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Rudiman. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Rodriguez, the Sergeant Major for the Adjutant General Directorate here at HRC, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Today, we're going to have, on behalf of Brigadier General James T. I. Coca, the Adjutant General, thank you and welcome us on a Facebook Live event here to talk about a very important subject, centralized promotions and the uh, preparedness for board files. The Adjutant General is of one of four directorates within HRC. One of those directorates happens to be the Evaluations, Selections, and Promotions Division, which is, again, a very important division when it comes to the fact that we are trying to let you there out at HR, there in the uh, field a better understanding of the promotion process. So right now, you're going to get it right from HRC. I have the uh, privilege of introducing the Sergeant Major for the ESPD, the Evaluation, Selection, and Promotions Division, Sergeant Major Haycraft. So without further ado, Sergeant Major Haycraft, I'll pass it over. Thank you, Sergeant Major Rodriguez. Good afternoon, Sergeant Major Rodriguez and our great Army team out there. I'd like to welcome you here to today's Town Hall. Today I'd like to cover um, to all of our viewers out there the promotion process. I have the privilege to go out and talk to our senior leaders uh, once a month at uh, the pre-command course. Um, so today I'd like to be able to give you that same information that I push out to all of our senior leaders. Once we're complete and I go over the process with you, well, I'll be able to answer a few questions and then I have subject matter experts standing by that can give you further feedback for uh, questions that I cannot get to. Mr. Ruman, can you pull up slide one, please? Before we go into the promotion process, I kind of like to quickly explain to you how we do our monthly promotions. Um, as you all probably well know, that promotions are based off Army readiness. So in order for us to um, make, you know, conduct monthly promotions, we have to have a requirement. So we work cl in close hands with the uh, Enlisted Personnel Management Directorate. Uh, they have a force alignment division. Those folks each month basically tell us, um, based off what requirements are out there, on how many uh, NCOs we can promote by MOS and by grade. So each month they provide us those numbers, and once we receive those numbers, we then go through and we scrub the uh, selection list to ensure that every NCO is fully qualified. Basically, they're NCOS trained and they're ready to be pinned on. Once we do that, we then publish the by name lists, and then we uh, push out the orders on or about the 24th or so of the month. So, Major Rodriguez, would you like to have anything to add? No, for everyone that's out there listening, you know, this is a very important topic uh, when it comes to understanding and educating yourself and for senior leaders and for soldiers to communicate this process. There's a lot of information out here that we're going to pass on to you today. And in the second half, we're going to talk about on the DA Secretariat piece when it board preparedness. But please understand that uh, there's a very complicated process here, but we're going to try to break it down for you so it can be very uh, uh, easily understood. So with that, Mr. Rudiman, we'll go to the first slide. Okay. Um, Sergeant Major Haycraft, we've got a number of questions in from the field. First one up is, 
I was eligible for last year's board. Why am I not eligible for this year's board? Um, that's a great question. Um, first and foremost, usually it's the uh, BASD requirement, the basic active service date. Um, the Army G1 provides us uh, with all the eligibility requirements and the basic active service date normally is the number one reason why soldiers are not eligible for the following year for promotion selection. Um, the other reason would, could be their age. Um, 1 October of 16, uh, we reduced the age from 62 down to 60. So any soldier that's over 60 uh, is not eligible for selection for promotion. Sergeant Rodriguez? You know, team, I'll tell you, it's really about engaging into the uh, changes that our Army has. Uh, every year, as the guidance comes out uh, with the MILPR messages, it's talking about Army readiness. When we're looking at the, uh, the field of folks that we're looking at for the potential for, uh, for promotion. So just make sure that, you know, you're talking, uh, you're reading on those MILPR messages so you fully understand uh, that, you know, it is Army requirements that we're looking at as we're looking for each, uh, each promotion uh, zone. So, Mr. Ruderman, if we can get the next question. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, next question up is, how can I best help myself get ready for the board? All right, that's a great question. And truly, that's a two-part question. Um, first and for foremost, before the board even is, is in consideration, um, non-commissioned officers, soldiers, you need to really truly understand and look at DAPAM 600-25. That PAM is your guide on what you need to accomplish within your career to uh, look, get looked at for your next selection. It's extremely important that you utilize uh, that PAM. Now, once you're preparing for the actual promotion selection board itself, once you get closer, then, then the most important piece truly at that point is reading that MILPER message. You have to understand what that MILPER message says. There's a lot of vital information inside that MILPER message that we publish about 120 days before the convene date of that promotion board. Um, for example, it tells you when your DA photo is due. It tells you when your um, records need to be validated, when my board file closes. For example, my board file closes 10 days before the convene date of that promotion board. It tells you when your evaluation is due, if you're going to do a complete the record or if you're going to turn in an annual. Um, also, you want to ensure you check your records and make sure your records are up to date. Ensure all your records match up. For example, ensure your uh, official IPERMS record matches your ERB, matches your DA photo. If you have an MSM, for example, on your, on your DA photo, you should have an MSM on your ERB as well as in your official records. So please, you need to really and truly ensure that all that stuff is straight and it, it matches the, uh, one another. And then lastly, ensure that you meet all the suspenses and the, the timelines on that meal per message. If you fail to do that, then it's not guaranteed for those items to be in the board and your board file may not be up to date for the members to see and, and make a good selection. So Major Rodriguez? You know, uh, Sergeant Major Haycraft put some things out that I'm just going to try to simplify. One is communicate. You need to communicate with uh, your leaders and possibly with your branch managers when it comes to uh, stuff when the promotion boards are coming out. If you're starting while the board is coming out, you, you're kind of late. Uh, you, you really got to start planning this uh, well in advance. Mentorship programs. These are things that, you know, we need to do better at with we need to educate our junior soldiers in preparing themselves for the next rank. You know, DA PAM 625 and 600-3 for the officers and enlisted is another tool that's used to better prepare yourselves beforehand, get to the left of it uh, when it comes down for these promotion boards. So again, how do you prepare yourself? Educate yourself, do some reading, talk to some, uh, some senior leaders, and from that point I think you'll be better prepared. So with that, we'll go to the next question, Mr. Rudiman. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next one up is, how do the STEP guidelines impact monthly promotions? Another uh, very good question, and an extremely important one. Um, select, train, educate, promote is uh, fairly, fairly new, so there's still a lot of questions out there that, we, that we're trying to answer and get the information out to you guys in the field. Um, first and, and most importantly, you have to be fully NCOS qualified before you can put on your next grade. So, for example, if you're a Sergeant First, uh, Staff Sergeant get, looking to get selected for Sergeant First Class, you have to have SLC complete before you can pin on Sergeant First Class. Um, how we do it monthly, um, once we get the numbers that come down from uh, Force Alignment Division telling us how many we can promote by MOS, we then scrub that selection list. So we start with the lowest sequence number. For example, sequence number one. If we have to promote five, say, 42 Alpha Sergeant First Classes, we look at sequence number one through five. 
Now, if all five of those NCOs are fully school trained and fully qualified, they get selected. However, let's say number four is not fully qualified, they have not been to SLC. That soldier, that NCO will be skipped over and we promote the next, uh, we'll promote number six, basically. So now once the next month comes along and say number four is now fully qualified and been school trained, number four will be the first one on the list to get selected. Um, lastly with STEP, NCOs have 24 months to ensure that they're fully qualified or they will be removed from the promotion list. If they are not school trained without a approved waiver by the first general officer in their chain of command, um, the first day of the 24th month, they will be removed from that list. Somebody Rodriguez? You know, I'll tell you, uh, what comes to mind on that is go to school on time. You know, there's a change in the way we look at promotions and STEP is, is an eligibility requirement. You must have it. So what I need really for all leaders to do is when your soldiers are due to go to school, you're going to need to go to school. Uh, that's just e easily said, you know. So the STEP guidelines, as Sergeant Major Haycraft explained, it's pretty clear that uh, you just need to go to school on time. So without further ado, we'll go to the next question. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next up, the question is, I have been selected to attend the U.S. Sergeant's Major Academy, but now I want to decline. How will that affect me? Um, Actually, that's a great question as well because we have a new change in that as well. Um, with the new MILPER message we just published for the next new assessment board, it's going to be held in August, uh, MILPER 17-142, there is no longer a declination um, of USASMA selection. So once you've been selected for USASMA at this point, the only way you can decline is if you retire in lieu of PCS or if you sign a declination to, be, to exit the Army uh, in lieu of PCS. Now in the past, we, we allow the declination. So what you have to do now, when you get looked at, when you're getting looked at for selection, um, you're preparing yourself for the promotion board. So when you do that, you have an opportunity to either opt in or opt out. That is your only chance to opt out. So if you opt in for selection, once that selection list gets uh, published, then that's considered your assignment notification, just like with the command selection list for the SAR majors that are going for battalion and, and brigade CSM. Once you get that notification, that's considered your PCS notification. And at that point, there is no declination of USASMA selection. Somebody Rodriguez? You know, again, to recap, it, it impacts readiness. Um, you know, declining, uh, I got it. Uh, there's things that happen uh, to individuals where they accept it or they compete it and then they go ahead and decline. But the bottom line is it impacts uh, Army readiness. So if, in fact, that uh, you are declining, uh, you know, Sergeant Major Haycraft was able to provide a very detailed way of what, what takes place. Uh, but it, the key thing is uh, to, uh, to make sure that, you know, you, you, you put that out ahead of time so that it doesn't impact on Army readiness. So we'll go to the next question. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next question is, can you explain a little more about the standby advisory board process when it's dealing with derogatory information? Um, yes, sir. Basically, uh, every soldier or NCO is on a promotion selection list. Um, once, once a month, we run a flag report to ensure that those soldiers are fully eligible for promotion. If a soldier is at that point flagged, we then flag them here at HRC level, and that flag cannot be removed unless a few things can happen. Um, let's say it's a height weight or a APFT fail. Um, once that soldier passes the height weight or, of course, passes their APFT, the uh, first 06 um, brigade commander will send us a memorandum letting us know whether or not or that the soldier had passed, and we'll remove the flag. Um, if it's an investigation, uh, once we have an investigation, then if it's found favorable or um, there was no issue with the soldier, everything, they're, they're found innocent, then same thing. Uh, the first 06 in the, in the command will give us a memorandum, letting us know that everything's good to go, we'll remove the flag. Now, if there was something founded in the investigation and there's an unfavorable removal of a flag, at this point, um, the commander sends us all the information, whether it's a, you know, a GOMAR, uh, Article 15, whatever the case may be, and we determine whether or not that soldier needs to be stabbed. Uh, about 95% of the time, that soldier will go before a standby advisory board. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a local letter GOMAR or if it's put in their soldier's uh, record. It still gets looked at and determined whether or not that soldier gets, goes before a stab board. Um, and it's extremely important that that the field understands that, that the, the, there's no difference between a local or um, going into an official record. 
the, the true thing here is they will probably be go before a stab. The board will then determine whether or not to retain that soldier. Um, and then the Army G1 will approve or disapprove. If it's approved, that soldier gets removed from the promotion list and they will have a chance to recompete the following year. Um, if they get retained, then we'll follow on with their promotion um, as when they're fully qualified and, and their sequence number would come up. Sergeant Major, any further things to add? Yeah, I, I do, Sergeant Major Haycraft. Uh, hey, bottom line is the advisory board is a process and it needs to be understood at all levels. So, you know, the information is out there in the regulations when it comes down to the fact that uh, you got to understand it. It's the process. Um, if you need help, you know, obviously the team is here to assist. But the bottom line, it's a process. Follow it. Sergeant Major Haycraft was able to explain in detail. If there's any more questions, we have our, uh, our team of experts that are on hand right now to answer those questions. So with that, we'll go to the next question, Mr. Ruderman. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, next question up, related one. What about standby advisory board due to the United States Senior Enlisted Review Board suitability? Um, this question is extremely important for all of our mass sergeant selects out there. Um, the suitability screening is done for all USASMA selects, all your CSL sergeant majors, and your nominative sergeant majors. Um, in promotions branch, we mostly deal with the uh, USASMA selects. So basically the way it works is once we release that USASMA selection list, uh, we push that to the Army G1, uh, D, or I'm sorry, the Army DA IG. Once the DAIG gets that list, they run scrubs. They look at CID records. They look at uh, military, uh, civilian military police or civilian police records. They look at uh, the IG database. Um, and if there's any derogatory information in those soldiers' records, they create a, a basically a list. Once that's list created, they have a, a an enlisted review board. It's called an ESER board that the Army G1 uh, DMPM. Director of Military Personnel Management uh, holds and conducts. Once they conduct that board, they determine on which NCOs, which mass sergeants will be go before a standby advisory board. They give us that information, and then we notify the field. Once we notify the field, those NCOs have 30 days to provide us as much um, documentation that, as they can to you know any rebuttal information, any um, letters to basically assist them with their stab process. Once we get that information, we put it in the stab packet, and the board will be held. Now this is extremely important because once this board is held, if those NCOs are removed from that promotion list, they do not have the opportunity to, be, to recompete for command for Sergeant Major. It's it. It's a one-time shot. So if they get removed, they no longer are eligible to compete. Um, if they are retained, then they'll get uh, into the non-resident course and they'll go along with their classmates and they'll get their sequence numbers and their and their frockings all at the same time. Um, but it's extremely important that they provide us that information so we can get that into their board file for the standby advisory board. Sergeant Major Rodriguez. No, Sergeant Major Haycraft, that's real important. You know, as Sergeant Major Haycraft gave in, in great detail, the why is the quality of the soldier. You know, right now, uh, the handshake that we'll find out in the second portion of this uh, uh, Facebook Live is going to talk about preparing for the board. This piece is really important that you've got to get your information in. Uh, in a timely manner so that the board members have the information that's needed to select, uh, you know, with the potential for the next rank. Uh, you know, the quality of the soldier is at stake when it comes to this and having that information in, in a timely manner. I think Sergeant Major Haycraft gave a, a very good explanation of what's involved. Although very complicated, it's all out there uh, with, uh, you know, regulations and, and links that are out there. So with that, um, Mr. Rudiman. Okay, thank you very much, Sergeant Major. And thank you very much, Sergeant Major Haycraft. Again, we would like to remind everyone that HRC staff are standing by right now to respond to your questions as soon as the live video portion of today's event is complete. So please send us in your questions as we continue here. And if you are just joining us, thank you. Uh, we are broadcasting today to the field from HRC headquarters at the Maud Complex on Fort Knox. If you missed today's broadcast, a video of the entire event and a transcript of the questions and answers from our Facebook feed will be posted to the HRC website for your future reference. Moving ahead now, we turn the floor over once again to the Sergeant Major of the Adjutant General Directorate, Sergeant Major Ray Rodriguez. Sergeant Major. Thank you, Mr. Rudiman. Again, uh, this is our second uh, portion of the uh, Facebook Live in which I have uh, the great honor of giving uh, some information. One, I want to tell Sergeant Major Haycraft thank you uh, for giving out a very detailed way of how the central uh, 
promotion process works. Uh, now we're going to uh, go into the DA Secretariat on board preparedness, which is very important for you in the field. Uh, right now we have uh, Captain Haybear, who is the uh, XO for the uh, DA Secretariat. So with that, sir, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Hey, good afternoon, team. Sergeant Major Rodriguez, Sergeant Major Haycraft. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, it's, it's a sure privilege to, uh, to uh, get in and address the field on some of these uh, questions that are uh, being circulated. So uh, my name is Captain Mike Hebert. I'm the Executive Officer for the DA Secretariat for Selection Boards. So what the DA Secretariat does is we conduct all centralized boards in the Army for the uh, regular Army and the Reserve component. Uh, we conduct 90 boards a year approximately and uh, I'm just going to go over real quick um, the five types of uh, boards we do. Uh, Mr. Ruman, next slide please. So uh, we conduct uh, promotion selection boards which are PSBs and that goes from E7 to Major General. We also conduct uh, command select list boards uh, for CSL which that is 05 command, 06 command and commands for CSMs either at the battalion brigade level to include nominative assignments and key billets. Uh, we also conduct school boards uh, for majors, that would be Command and General Staff College, also known as ILE. Uh, and for colonels, that's Senior Service College, also known as War College. And then for the enlisted, we do the Sergeant Majors Academy uh, Selection Board, which ultimately will lead to their promotion to Sergeant Major. We also conduct separation boards. These include uh, officer separation boards, uh, release from active duty boards, which are refrad boards for the reserve component, and as alluded to before, uh, stabs on the enlisted side. Uh, and then we uh, conduct uh, special boards, uh, which con includes uh, command review boards, promotion review boards, and, uh, and stabs. I said stabs in the earlier, but I meant to say uh, stabs are a, type, a special type of board that's conducted uh, as well. So uh, that being said, as you can imagine, we get a lot of questions uh, from the field and people are very curious about the selection system, as they should be as it pertains to your, uh, your promotion and, and everything else uh, in your service in the Army. So uh, with all that being said, we compiled some of the more common questions and uh, I would like to share some of those answers with you today. Uh, Mr. Rudiman, can I have the first question, please? Yes, sir. Um, first one, Captain Hebert, what does the board see? That's a great question. Um, so the attached uh, slide that you'll see up on, uh, up on the screen will show you exactly uh, what the board sees. Uh, the first thing would be any scanned documentation to the board, such as a, um, a letter to the board president. Uh, I'll cover this in more detail in a, in a later slide. Uh, the next thing they'll see for the majority of the files will be a DA photo. The DA photo will only be seen if you have uh, a current DA photo. Uh, again, I'll cover that in a little more detail in, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, finally, after the DA photo, you're going to have your record brief, which will include, it, that would be the enlisted record brief, the officer record brief, or the civilian record brief uh, for the civilian boards uh, we conduct. Uh, the voting members will always have the record brief up on one of the two monitors, so they'll be able to uh, cross-reference uh, your file. Uh, your record brief is essentially a resume, it's extremely important and it, it, it serves as a reference point for voters. Uh, next slide please. So uh, the next will be your performance section of your uh, Army Military Human Resource Record, your AMHER. Um, so uh, the performance uh, portion of this is your evaluations, okay? So that's your NCOERs, your OERs, or your AERs. And they'll be listed in chronological order starting from your most recent down to your, uh, your first one you ever received. Um, so there's a misconception out in the field that they'll only be able to see your last three or your last five. Uh, that is uh, totally not true. Uh, they'll be able to see every, uh, every evaluation. Now, if you were an NCO and you became an officer, those NCOERs will be masked and they will not see those. They will only see your, uh, your officer reports. Uh, after your performance file is your education and training, which uh, includes your transcripts, high school, college, doctorate, etc., uh, as well as uh, your uh, medals or, or awards that you've earned um, over your time uh, in your service. Uh, followed by that will be your, uh, your disciplinary uh, file. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, this is disciplinary that is in your open fish, meaning stuff that is not in your restricted uh, file. So that being said, um, it is the very last thing to be seen and that's done by design. So if you have something, uh, some bad paper in your file, the voting member will look at your entire body of work 
and then they will review your disciplinary data and then they'll cast the, uh, their score on your file. Um, if you do have stuff in your restricted disciplinary file, that will only be seen in very rare instances. Uh, and that will be uh, highlighted in the MILPER message. The MILPER message will say that uh, that restricted file will be open. This is mostly in um, separation boards, uh, which are rare. Uh, so for the most part, if it is in your restricted uh, disciplinary file, it will not be seen. And you out in the field, uh, you're able to see what's in your own uh, restricted file going through your uh, iPerms. So you can see exactly what's in your file. Now, all that being said, I do want to uh, share with you a tool uh, so you know exactly what the board members are going to uh, see. And that is uh, the My Board File Certification application. It's a web-based uh, application on the HRC website. And what this does is it allows you to look at and review your entire file that's going to be seen for whatever selection board you're coming up on. Okay, this uh, file is open 60 days before the board convene date. Convene date is simply the start date of the board and it closes about seven days, seven to ten days before the start of the date. This will all be annotated in the MILPER. That being said, that gives you a, about a two month window to review your file so you can see exactly what the board members are going to see. You need to take this time, it's very important, to look at your entire file and see if anything is misfiled in your, in your, uh, in your, in your stuff. So if you have uh, someone else's disciplinary documents, someone else's award, etc., make notes and then take all of those compiled notes to your unit S1 to get, uh, to get it fixed. That being said, if you do not certify your file, your file will still be seen by the selection board. It does not opt you out by any means. It just means you didn't take the time to look at what, what's going to be seen. And also, um, just remember, if you annotate things on the website, it doesn't mean it's going to automatically be fixed. You have to take the next step of bringing all those issues to your Unit S1 uh, and, and get all those things fixed in your records. And it's open for 60 days, so you have plenty of time to do it. Uh, Sergeant Major, do you have anything to add? I will tell you that, uh, you know, it's a very, very detailed way of, of giving the field all the information uh, that they have required. I'll sum it up with just a bottom line is everything is looked at. Take the time to get with uh, your uh, HR professionals so that you know what documents you need to submit. But more importantly, get with your senior leaders, your mentors, to go ahead and give the information that they think that, hey, listen, uh, you know, you don't have to go through this alone. Uh, there's a lot of guidance out there. There's a lot of links. Uh, some of the things that we'll talk about at the end will be uh, the mock board for the, uh, the enlisted and for officers about what's involved with the process and all these documents and how they play a critical role in preparing for the board. So again, sir, thank you for being able to provide uh, all the information, the technicalities that the field needs to know in getting ready for their board. So with that, we're going to go to our next question. Mr. Rudiman, please. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next one up, get a lot of these in from the field. How important is my DA photo? Okay, the DA photo is extremely, extremely important. It serves as your first handshake to the board. Up to that point, um, all your stuff is is paperwork that's seen on a computer. That photo humanizes your file. It shows the board members uh, your discipline, how you wear your uniform, how you look, um, etc. Uh, and it is, it, I can't overstate how important the DA photo is. And I'm sure you've heard this uh, a lot, and I, I'm going to uh, hopefully illuminate some stuff for you on the next slide here, here in a second. So here's some guidelines about the DA photo. Uh, first of all, get a new DA photo every five years. Our system cannot pull in DA photos that are older than five years old. It will not pull it in from Datmus. Okay, so get a new photo every five years. If you get promoted, get a new photo. If you get an award above an ARCOM, get a new photo. Uh, in general, it is good to have an updated photo for any type of selection board that you're going to be competing for. Okay. Um, so that being said, in your uniform, make sure you have the necessary alterations, make sure you're wearing everything that you have earned, uh, have a battle buddy inspect you with your uniform on so it contours to your body, uh, which is very important versus laying it flat on a bed or something like that. Uh, when you go to the photo studio, all photo studios are not created equal, so they're all slightly different. So when you go to the studio, go with a battle buddy, have them look at, uh, 
inspect you before you take your photo. And if you're not happy with the photo, ask or request for a new one. Do what you have to do. This photo is super important. So make sure uh, you get one and, and make sure it counts. Um, so I know you've heard this a lot and you're probably saying, I got a new photo. I hear this all the time, get a new photo. But I'm here to tell you, uh, I'm gonna show you a slide here of recent DA photos uh, of, of these instances that still happen to this day. Uh, Mr. Rudman, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, sir. All right, so you see on this slide, there's uh, some examples of bad DA photos, okay? This uh, is by no means all of the bad DA photos that we have compiled, uh, and these are relatively recent. From left to right, you'll see an individual, he's wearing his nameplate on the wrong side. Uh, we have another photo of someone who's not in the uh, prescribed uniform, and then the last photo is the individuals wearing uh, full dress medals. Uh, I've also seen photos of uh, individuals who um, are wearing their dress blues or ASU uniform uh, with absolutely nothing on them, not altered at all, just straight from AFI's, uh, a blank uh, blue suit. So uh, I know you hear this a lot, okay, but I wanted to show you these pictures uh, just to tell you that this still happens. These are not that old. Um, and like I said before, and we've consistently mentioned all the time, it is an extremely important part of your board file. Uh, Sergeant Major, do you have anything to add? Sir, uh, you've got a, a very detailed way of, of saying that how important is, is it? It's important. You know, every year, uh, this is the number one comment that comes out for the review and analysis when it comes into the actual boards from every CMF. So it is critically important that you take the time to go ahead and make sure that you're getting, like uh, Captain Haber has said, battle buddies and that, you know, within five years, acknowledge that that is it meeting requirements. But talk to your leaders, talk to your mentors, and making sure that, you know, you're seeing that you've got that, as uh, Captain Haber said, it is the handshake to the panel member. As a former panel member, I will tell you that is the first thing that comes up. It's not all that's considered. There's many factors that are considered, but having that photo and having it um, out there for the board member to see is very critical, so it is important. And with that, we'll go to our next question. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Captain Haber, our next one in from the field is, how much time do the board members spend on my file? It's a good question. Uh, we get that question uh, often. So the answer is there's no set amount of time that a, a board member can review uh, your file. They can look at as much or as little of your file as they would like to based on their individual voting philosophy. Uh, we do not hold a stopwatch to them. We do not time them. Uh, we do not rush them or slow them down. Uh, so. So that being said, in reality, there's still a, a start date and an end date to boards, okay? There's 90 boards a year. Uh, they take approximately three weeks uh, for the most part uh, for each board, okay? There's only two weeks of the entire year that we don't have anything scheduled. So, so that being said, so what that means for my staff is that uh, we have to work early mornings, late nights, Saturdays, Sundays, et cetera, uh, to accommodate uh, the pace of the voters. So if uh, whatever that pace is because we have to get done in that prescribed amount of time. But they do not have any time constraints based on, um, on your file on how much time they can spend. Now, that would depend greatly on how many um, things are in your file. So if you're going to a captain, let's say, you may only have one to three evaluations. So it'd be far less time spending on that uh, file than if you're going for Sergeant Major or something like that or to, go, to attend the Sergeant Major Academy. Um, Sergeant Major. No, that's a great point, sir. Uh, you know, train the standard, not the time. Uh, there's a lot of files uh, that are being looked at by panel members. It is key that they go ahead and uh, they get the information. Um, you know, and having not a time constraint, but obviously selecting the potential for that next for that next rank is critical. So again, standard, not the time, uh, is is the best way to sum it up. So with that, we'll go to our next question, Mr. Rudiman. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next one is, should I write a letter to the board president for a specific issue? Yeah, so great question, and, and the answer is it depends. So every soldier uh, in the field has the right to, uh, to write a letter to the board president. Um, 
So uh, when you write a letter to the board president, you want to use this for extraordinary circumstances, okay? So something to bring attention uh, to your file. So I'll give you a good example. A good example would be uh, a soldier uh, who was injured for combat-related uh, wounds in Afghanistan, let's say, and hasn't had an evaluation in you know two years. Uh, that would be a good example to write a short, concise uh, letter to the board president uh, explaining the situation um, and using the correct memorandum uh, format on 25-50 to explain the circumstances. That would be a great example of writing a letter to the board president. Uh, some bad examples would be uh, highlighting an issue like a, a derogatory piece of information uh, that, that may not even be in your file anymore or um, talking about why you didn't get promoted last year, reciting the NCO creed. Um, these are some things that, uh, that, that uh, we've seen and um, you can write it by, by all means, you can write it, however we caution you that it may not be the most helpful thing that you can do for yourself um, if it's, uh, it's self-serving. Uh, now if you do choose to write a letter to the board president, please follow the, uh, the memorandum formatting from 25-50, get with someone who writes a lot of memorandums, for example commanders or staff NCOs who prepare memorandums, they can help you, uh, help you draft those things and, and get them in the right format, um, and uh, short, concise, to the point, uh, explaining the situation. One last thing I'll add about uh, letters to the board president, the name can be a little misleading. So the letter is not specifically just going to the board president. Uh, everyone on that board is going to see that uh, letter. So if it's an officer board, for example, er all the 15 to 23 members or whatever it is is going to see that letter. If you're on an enlisted board, and let's say you're an 11 series, 11 Bravo specifically, that letter will only be contained to the 11 Bravo panel who's voting the 11 Bravo population. And, that, and I'll sh you can see that in the mock board, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the link for that a little bit later. You can see exactly how, how boards are, are conducted like that. Sergeant Major? No, sir, you were very detailed in that. You know, really what it comes down to, absolutely. You know, if, if the guidance in the regulation causes you to generate that letter, go ahead and do it. Captain Haber was able to give a very good way of seeing the different circumstances in what would require doing a letter for the board president. You know, panel members uh, will see that letter. Uh, they'll already see an anomaly of things that are in your file already, but if you need to put more clarification, that's what that letter does. But again, follow the guidance that's already provided um, because a lot of that stuff could already be captured with not having to put that letter in. But if you absolutely need to do that letter, the options there for you. So we'll go to the next question, please. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Next up, how does my file compare against my peers? Okay, good question. All right, so um, at this current time, uh, so we cannot let anyone know specifically how they did on a board or release order of merit lists. We are under uh, pretty strict guidelines uh, based in either law or regulations of what we can and cannot release and who we can release them to. The majority of our products go to the Army G1 or DMPM that works for the Army G1. Now, that being said, um, I can offer you some advice to help you um, gain some indication of where, where you may stand. And, and one, it's your, the first part is your evaluation. So there, like we alluded to before, there's many documents that they're going to see in your file, but your evaluation is uh, the most important document of your file, uh, all of your evaluations, the, the compilation of them all, because your evaluation is really telling the board your future potential or your lack of potential for selection of for whatever you're competing for. So uh, that document is extremely important and it's, it is nice for you, but it's really for that board to see and assess your file. Now, that being said, who, who has, who's involved in writing uh, evaluations, right? It's your raider and your senior raider and of course the rated soldier and if you have other raiders in, in the middle. Uh, but so they have an obligation, your raider and senior raider have an obligation to you uh, to let you know how you stand and how uh, what you can do to do better, what you've done, and your your performance, and then your future potential uh, to serve at, for selections in the Army. So uh, that should not be uh, the first time you get your evaluation. Should not be your uh, counseling tool. You know, you should be counseled monthly, quarterly, etc., up to that point, and should know where you stand and what you have to do to get a better uh, evaluation. 
uh, so to speak. Now, that being said, what you owe your raters and senior raters is, uh, first of all, the willingness to accept criticism, the willingness to accept praise, uh, and change uh, things that you need to change. So it's an honest two-way dialogue. Uh, we need honesty uh, in this day and age. We need to know, and you have to provide uh, that moral, you know, upstanding receptor of that information as well as asking the tough questions to your rater and senior rater. So don't, so, uh, don't be afraid to ask them. Uh, secondly, talk, uh, talk to your branch representatives, okay, your branch managers, okay? So they, while your raters and senior raters have a good perspective of what you've done in your unit, in your area, whatever it is you're doing at that time, your branch reps will have a greater understanding of your, of your cohort, of what, are the, what the Army needs across the board, um, and what you, jobs you should do next. Now, as alluded to before, I think the Sergeant Major alluded to before, obviously you need to reference 600-25, your career maps, or 600-3 if you're an officer before you talk to your uh, branch reps. But armed with that knowledge, you, then you can talk to them and you can ask them what they think, how, how you rack and sack, where you should go next, what you're competitive for. I can speak specifically for active um, Army officers. Uh, I know OPMD here in HRC does an excellent job of communicating to their cohorts. So I know, for, for example, I can talk to my branch managers. I've received very honest, candid feedback of what I'm competitive for, uh, what I'm not competitive for, what I should do, and generally steering me, uh, and steering me in the right direction. So, so all that being said, this is our current system that we're currently operating in. It doesn't mean um, it doesn't mean it can't or won't change, but this is our current uh, system. Uh, so you need to be able to do well in the current system, uh, and and hopefully all this will help, Sergeant Major. Sir, uh, I think you know as the question stated, uh, you know how does my file compare against peers? Uh, I, I would tell you th the way to look at it is you know what is the requirement that the Army needs me to have the potential for the next rank. You know, as uh, Captain Haber has indicated, the career maps and, you know, obviously that's actually coming out of the uh, DA PAM 625 for enlisted and 600-3 for the officers. That is the measurement that, you know, is coming out of proponent to what you need to be doing. You know, when the folks are being looked at for the board, it is literally between pluses and minuses of an individual. What will happen is they will go ahead and be put together and it is very clear that some will, will exceed than others. But for the most part, humble yourself that everyone is looked the same, but it does come into some of the things that jobs and certain opportunities that they had in their career. So looking at you know, your peers, there's different things that they have done in order to get, be, have them successful and depending on what board they went to. But you know, as Captain Haber indicated, you know, it is really what is put out there that the uh, panel members are having to go and take a look at what's uh, the potential that you have for your for your next promotion. So, again, you know, don't look at it just as peers. Look at what the army needs of you, and then of course, continue to work with and communicate with your senior leaders and mentors out there to see that you know obviously you're on the right track. So, with that, we'll go to our next question, Mr. Ruderman, please. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Captain Earbeer, one more question: Does the DA Secretariat provide statistical? or trend analysis? Uh, good question. We, uh, we, this is also a question we get uh, a lot of the time. So the short answer is no. Okay, so the DA secretary does not conduct uh, analysis or trend analysis and uh, to be frank we really don't want to get into that business. Uh, the DA secretary is really the, uh, the standard keeper for uh, the sanctity of the board process. Uh, so there's many things that the DA secretary does. We go at extraordinary lengths to not influence board members or anyone for that matter that comes through there on how, uh, on how they vote files. So for, for example, uh, we, everything we hand out to board members, piece of paper, briefing, etc., is legally approved, has been through a process of approval. It takes about nine months for recorders even to get certified to really uh, to run or administer a board at all. Um, so it's a very uh, stringent process. Um, so, uh, and when, when the board members are there, we're there to take care of all their logistical and, and administrative needs, make sure they have a hotel, make sure they get paid, make sure they get there on time, uh, et cetera, and then take care of them once they get in into the board. Uh, and then they can then use their senior leader judgment to, to judge these files. Now, um, 
if we started doing statistics or trend analysis, that could inadvertently influence board members, and that's not what we, we ever want to do, and it's against kind of like our mission. So, um, but that being said, I will mention OPMD again uh, here at HRC. So again, uh, on the OP side of the house, they do a very good job uh, of releasing uh, board trends and some analysis when board results get published. So for example, I know uh, my branch will send will send basic trend analysis when a promotion board concludes out to the, they'll blast it out to the entire cohort uh, via email and, and they'll have basic trends. Now these are gathered by uh, trained statisticians, ORSAs, and then given to branch managers and they apply some more rigor to that st those uh, statistics that they get and then blast those trends out. So uh, those those documentations are, uh, it, it's very helpful and if uh, if you're not getting those, make sure you're asking your, uh, your branch reps for those. Um, Ms. Rudman, can I have the next slide please? Yes, sir. So uh, this, slide, uh, this slide that's up here is some helpful links. So uh, this has, really I want to draw your attention to the uh, enlisted and officer mock board link. So these um, uh, mock board or LPDs essentially go into great detail on the officer board process and the enlisted board process. They're about an hour each, 40 to 60 minutes each. Okay, one's about a year old and the enlisted one's about 18 months old at this point. Uh, I really encourage you to watch these. Uh, and then and really to take down your questions to bring to your unit leaders or unit S1s, et cetera, because these will really give you a good baseline of, uh, of how we conduct selection boards. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not secretive, but we have it out there. You just need to know where to find it, and this, these links will help you, uh, help you get there. So at, at some point, you're going to be considered by, uh, by a selection board, okay? So there's a lot of these, uh, these helpful links, uh, these things, my board file, these mock boards, other, uh, other tools on the HRC website to help you out. But in addition to all that, you need to talk to your, your leaders, your senior leaders, your S1 types, uh, and, and get, uh, get advice, get guidance, talk to your branch reps. You really have to do your research, empower yourself, and then talk to them with the pointed questions that, that you can get answers from, not, not emotional questions, fact-based questions. So uh, it's really been a pleasure for me to be here today uh, uh, talking to you all. Um, this has been fun, and uh, I, I really hope this helps. Um, and Sergeant Major, that's all I got. No, sir, thanks. You know, again, Captain Haber, thanks for uh, spending the time to kind of give in detail uh, preparing for the board. You know, some of the things that uh, the DA Secretariat does um, is preparing uh, for the board itself. You know, going back to, to one of the questions about uh, the statistics, it's easy. Uh, it's Army readiness. Army readiness is what's providing, uh, you know, the information and, and how we promote uh, our next leaders. Uh, it's very key that when we go ahead, um, you know, folks want to see what were the results, but it's something that what was the requirements for the Army at that time. Every year it changes. So with that, just keep in mind that as long as you're communicating with your leaders and you're making sure that, you know, you're engaging yourself, reading up on the MILPR messages, go ahead uh, and ask the questions. You know, you're getting it straight from HRC today on a topic that, uh, me and the adjutant general get uh, as we travel to a lot of installations you know so stay up with the changes the changes are something that you know that change uh, times of, of army readiness and then how and, and the promotion uh, is affected step is a good example of how now education is part of the eligibility for boards uh, the best thing I can tell you is that continue to do the best that you can each and every day uh, in, in doing the jobs uh, and, and the fact that, you know, promotion will come. It, it will come. Uh, obviously, the timeline is based on, you know, the audience. Everyone is uh, at a point where they're equal. There's pluses and minuses in all of it. Uh, and I will tell you this, that, you know, you will go ahead and do well uh, in serving. Uh, so, again, today that we've got our uh, team of experts that are out there taking your questions, uh, we're going to go ahead and try to answer as many, all of them, as we can when it comes down to, uh, you know, this segment of uh, in concluding our uh, centralized promotion and board preparation. Again, readiness drives everything uh, with, within uh, the, what we do here at HRC. And again, I want to just be able to thank uh, the team here 
and, and able to give us a, an opportunity to go ahead and explain the process in, in detail. So with that, sir, Mr. Rubin, back to you. Thanks very much, Sergeant Major, and thank you very much, Captain Hebert. Uh, we are drawing now down to the end of the live video portion of this town hall, but we'd like to remind everyone that our HRC subject matters are online now, beginning to answer your questions from the field. This is an open invitation to every soldier, wherever you are stationed, to get centralized promotion and board file information directly from HRC subject matter experts. Again, everyone who asks a question will get a response. So take advantage of this opportunity to get the information you need to grow and advance your Army career. We'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that if you've missed any part of today's broadcast, or if you have a battle buddy you know should watch this, the video and a transcript of the questions and answers from our Facebook feed <coughs> will be posted to the HRC website in a day or two. So please check back and use those as your reference material. We will be back with our next town hall to the field toward the end of summer. Subject matter still to be determined. In the meantime, we urge you to check back periodically at Army HRC for important career information developments and feel free at any time to submit your questions to HRC for the latest and most accurate info on a host of matters that affect you, your family, and your career. So we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sergeant Major Rodriguez, Sergeant Major Haycraft, and Captain Hebert. A big thank you as well to our high-speed tech team here at the Maud Complex. And thank you in the field for joining us today. Check back with Army Human Resources to Command to get it right at Army HRC. Signing off now from the Maud Complex, this has been Army HRC.